John Dee was an English born, though his family were Welsh, a mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, a cult philosopher, and imperialist. He lived in Mortlake, West London, for most of his life. He was an educated man that studied at St John's College in Cambridge. He was eventually accepted into the influential circles of the ruling elite and acted as scientific advisor and confidant to Queen Elizabeth I. He's associated with coining the phrase, the British Empire. During the early part of his life, they had very little interest in the supernatural. In later life, however, he became disillusioned with science and began experimenting with the occult. He believed that numbers were the basis of all things and the key to all knowledge. John Dee admitted that he had prayed since his youth for pure and sound wisdom and the understanding of God's truths and the natural and artificial truths, which could be used for the honour of God and to benefit mankind. Not satisfied with the choice of books and knowledge he had access to, and being a deeply religious Christian and Bible believer, he is said to have decided to invoke angels for answers. John Dee is said to have devoted much of his time and effort in the last 30 years or so of his life attempting communications with angels and demons in order to learn the universal language of creation and think about the pre-apocalyptic unity of mankind. John Dee and his partner Edward Kelly, an English lawyer that had both his ears cropped when he was pilloried as a punishment for forgery, a common punishment during the Tudor dynasty. Edward Kelly had spent much of his time studying alchemy, attempting to turn base elements into cold. Disappointed by his results, he turned to black magic. The following account was taken from the Lancashire folklore by John Harland and T.T. Wilkinson, written in 1867. In the reign of Queen Elizabeth I and the year 1560, three judicial astrologers met in Preston for the purpose of raising a corpse by incantations. They were Dr. John D, Warden of Manchester, Edward Kelly, his assistant, and Sia and Paul Waring of Dovecotes near Claydenbrook. Casabin, in his true and faithful account of what passed for many years between John D and some spirits apparently quoting from Weaver's funeral momentum states that aforesaid Master Edward Kelly, a person well skilled in a judicial astrology, with one Paul Waring, who acted with him in these incantations and all these conjurations, went to the churchyard of St. Leonard's in Walton Le Dale, near Preston, and entered the burial ground exactly at midnight. The moon shining brightly for the purpose of raising the body of the person who had been interred there, and who had, during his lifetime, hidden a quantity of money without disclosing the fact previous to his death. Having had the grave pointed out to them on the preceding day, they opened it, removed the coffin lid, and set to work by various exorcisms. Until the body became animated by the spirit entering it again. It is not only satisfied with their wicked desires, it is said, but delivered several strange predictions concerning persons in their neighbourhood, which were literally and exactly fulfilled. Sibley, in his occult scientist, relates a similar account of this transaction and also gives an engraving representing the scene.
The British Museum holds several items that were once owned by John Dee, including a speculum mirror believed to help see spirits, an elaborately decorated wax seal of God used to support the shell stone, and a gold amulet engraved with a representation of one of Edward Kelly's visions. In the year 1581, occultist John Dee and Edward Kelly claimed they had received communications from angels who provided them with the foundations of a language with which to communicate with what they described as the other side. The angelic language contained its own alphabet grammar and sign text which Dee and Kelly wrote down in journals. The new language was called the Enochian due to John Dee's assertion that the biblical ancestor of Noah, patriarch Enoch, was the last human to have known the language. Much mystery surrounds John Dee, hidden beneath a painting of John Dee performing an experiment for Queen Elizabeth I is a dark secret. X-ray imaging of the stately Victorian artwork has revealed that the original painting showed Dee surrounded by human skulls before they painted over it. Painting was not the first image from that period to have been altered. A portrait created by an unknown artist in the 1580s or the early 1590s of Queen Elizabeth I was also manipulated. The portrait showed the monarch holding a bunch of roses. The picture was kept in poor condition which caused some of the paint to crumble off, exposing the fact that the original image had shown her holding a snake. The reason it was painted over remains unknown. Dr. Tanya Cooper of the Making Art in the Tudor Britain Project said, the recent technical analyst of these remarkable portraits has been critical of our understanding of the Tudor painting. The portrait of Queen Elizabeth with a hidden serpent is a really unusual survival. Yet it is difficult to know exactly why the serpent may have been originally included or how common of a motif this might have been. The Queen certainly owned jewellery and costumes including emblems of serpents which were probably understood as a symbol of wisdom. However, no other portrait of Elizabeth appears to depict her holding a snake. John Dee and Edward Kelly would contact many spirits, but one spirit in particular would continue to dominate the screams. Appearing time and time again, she called herself Madimi. Dee would eventually name his daughter after her. Dee recorded in his diary that Madimi was a spiritual creature like a little girl of seven or nine years of age. Half angel and half elfin, this spirit taught Dee the Enochian language. John Dee and Edward Kelly enjoyed celebrity status before being expelled from Prague for sorcery. Things took a turn for the worse for John Dee and Edward Kelly's relationship when they were staying in Count Wilhelm Rosenberg's palace in Treuben when Madame requested that Edward Kelly and John Dee shared everything including wives. To begin, John Dee rejected the request and the request angered his wife Jane, 
but in May 1587 they went through with it. After they did this the angelic messages dried up and Darmy and the other angels that had visited John Dee and Edward Kelly for seven years had now gone. Edward Kelly left and was never known to see John Dee again. Jane Dee gave birth to a child nine months later that John Dee raised as his own. John Dee, for this part, returned to England with his family and sought an audience with Queen Elizabeth. Shortly afterwards, Dee was given a wardenship of the Christ College, Manchester. Dee returned to Mortlake in 1605 to spend the last days of his life in peace. Dee was left disappointed and frustrated by his search for knowledge and after the death of Queen Elizabeth, King James I offered Dee no support and Dee was forced to sell much of his possessions in his final years to support himself and the children that cared for him. He died at the age of 81. Like a cultist before him, John Dee, Edward Alexander Crowley, better known as Alistair Crowley, also claimed to have contacted entities from different realities. In his book, Magic in Theory in Practice, he writes, it was a theory of the ancient magicians that any living being is a storehouse of energy varying in quantity according to the size and health of the animal and in quality according to its mental and moral character. At the death of the animal this energy is liberated suddenly. This animal should therefore be killed within the circle or triangle as the case may be so that its energy cannot escape. An animal should be selected whose nature accords with that of the ceremony. Thus by sacrificing a female lamb one would not obtain any appreciate quality of the fiery energy useful to a magician who is invoking Mars. In such a case a ram would be more suitable and this ram should be a virgin the whole potential of its original total energy should not be diminished in any way. For the high spiritual working, one must accordingly choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force. The male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable victim. Like John Dee before him, Alistair Crowley worked as a British spy and even claims to have infiltrated the Nazi party. It is widely speculated that the eventual capture of Nazi politician Rudolf Hess was actually due to the work of Alistair Crowley as a British spy. He's also thought to have written fake Nazi propaganda in order to make the Nazis appear to be ridiculous. Despite being described as the wickedest man on the planet and the beast, a 2002 list of the 100 greatest Britons, which had Sir Winton Churchill as number one, listed Alistair Crowley as the 73rd greatest Briton of all time. associated with secret societies like the Ordo Templi Orientis, the Open Source Order of the Golden Dawn and the Tefanian Order. Alistair Crowley was highly influential to many musicians, Led Zeppelin, Jay-Z, David Bowie, 
Ozzy Osbourne and many others have promoted his ideas and beliefs. He also features on the Beatles' Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club album cover. He was also the creator of his own religion. Philema was a religion that includes and mixes ideas from occultism, yoga and both Eastern and Western mysticism, especially Hermetic Kabbalah. According to Philemic legends, in 1918, Alistair Crowley, using magic and ritual, came into contact with an interdimensional entity named Lamb. Alistair Crowley's sketch of Lamb has a striking resemblance to what many alien abductees and eyewitnesses have described in their experience. Lamb was not the only spirit that Alistair Crowley claimed to communicate with. On April 8th, 9th and the 10th in 1904, he claimed to hear the voice of an entity over his left shoulder. He called this entity Awas. He believed Awas was a minister of Hall Parkrat, meaning Horus the child. Crowley considered this spirit to be the central deity within Valemic cosmology. In his book of law, he describes his experiences. The voice of Awas apparently came from over my left shoulder, from the furthest corner of the room. It seemed to echo itself in my physical art in a very strange manner. Hard to describe, I noticed a similar phenomenon when I had been waiting for a message, fraught with great hope or dread. The voice was passionately poured, as if I was were alert about the time limit. The voice was deep, timber, musical and expressive, its tones solemn, tender, fierce and aught else as suited the mood of the message. Not bass, perhaps a tenor or a baritone. The English was free of either native or foreign accents, perfectly pure of local or caste mannerisms thus startling and even uncanny at first hearing. I had a strong impression that the speaker was actually in the corner, where he seemed to be, in a body of fine manner, transparent as a veil goes, or a cloud of intense smoke. He seemed to be a tall dark man, in his thirties, well knit, active and strong, with a face of a savage king, and eyes veiled, lest their gaze should destroy what they saw. The dress was not Arab, it suggested Assyria or Persia, but very vaguely. I took little notice of it, for me, at that time, I was, was an angel, such as I had often seen in visions, a being purely astral. In March 1887, when Crowley was 11, his father died of tongue cancer. Crowley described this as a turning point in his life, Alistair Crowley claims himself to be a prophet entrusted with guiding humanity into the Aeon of Horus in the early 20th century. In Alistair Crowley's Religion of Philema, it is believed that the history of humanity can be divided into a series of Aeons, each of which was accompanied by its own forms of magical and religious expression. The first of these was the Aeon of Isis which Fermilites believed occurred during prehistory and which saw mankind worshipping a great goddess symbolised by an ancient deity, Isis. This was followed by the Aeon of Osiris, a period that took place in the classical and medieval centuries when humanity worshipped a singular male god, symbolised by the Egyptian god, Osiris.
and therefore dominated by factual values. And finally, the third aeon, the aeon of Horus, which controlled the child god, symbolized by Horus. In this new aeon, Vermiloids believe that humanity will enter a time of self-realization and self-actualization.